Hey, this is the Nate Jamar Rick Cliff. And believe it or not, whether you like it or don't like it, learn to love it. Because you have to listen to Wrestling Is Real. It is the best thing going today. Woo! The worldwide leader of podcasting excellence. The king of podcasts radio network proudly presents The Wrestling Is Real Podcast. Because wrestling needs us. This is the next and the last episode of the Wrestling Is Real Podcast for the year 2023. 817 episodes in. And thanks for listening. This is King of Podcasts once again with you for another program. We will be doing a post show for AEW World's End, which is Saturday night. And I will do a post show for that going through the card. We'll do a little bit of preview predictions on that a little bit later on. Tonight's program, I want to go and focus on initially going on Friday night to watch one of two movies that I watched at the theaters over the weekend, the movie Plex. One was Aquaman, which was horrible. It was mid. Okay. It was fine. I, I watched it. It was okay. But on Friday night, most anticipated movie all year was the Iron Claw. When I saw that first trailer, I want to say it was back in February or March. I was saying to myself, I can't wait to watch this movie. I was like, I got to go watch it. And I had a best friend of mine, you know, one of my fellow Buccaneer fans decided to go along with me. Long time wrestling fan. So we both grew up on the fact that, you know, and I've made my story clear about when it comes to leading up to the Iron Claw, that I didn't get to watch world-class championship wrestling when it was just a regular show and you could watch it on syndication. Uh, My opportunity to watch it was on ESPN weekdays at four o'clock. It was one of those days at four o'clock that if it wasn't Aussie rules football or it wasn't AWA wrestling, that world-class would be on during that. And that's what I got to watch was legends of WCCW. And it was great. And I always kind of followed along with what we had in terms of what world class was a good understanding of the Von Eriks and all the people within that company, which, you know, the Iron Claw, the movie itself, they didn't go at, into the entire idea of trying to go and depict exactly what world class championship wrestling was as an organization. And that's fine. You know, that's not what they were trying to do. They were trying to get this movie to be out to a very mainstream, broad audience. The story of the Von Erichs and their tragedy is story enough. Did they take a little bit of creative levity to go ahead and, you know, move the timeline across? Sure. I mean, for wrestling fans that are going to really nitpick the fact that, oh, okay, that Harley Race looked older and Ric Flair, the guy they picked, you know, to be him, Aaron Eisenberg was initially like a great depiction, but. It didn't have to be. And, you know, listen, I can go ahead and complain about the fact that the guy that they put as Bill Mercer, he's a good actor, but he's not Bill Mercer. You know, they didn't try to go ahead and replicate world class. That wasn't their intent. I understand that part. It didn't have to be. They absolutely got the sportatorium down right. They got the crowds right. They didn't get Mark Lawrence right. They didn't get David Manning right. Okay, listen, I can nitpick, but it's not. And I had to look past that throughout the whole movie. And when I look at what they did and you get the whole buildup of the story to them and Kevin and his wife and their relationship and the whole coinciding of the family centering around the patriarch Fritz von Erich and seeing those four boys work their way to go ahead and just realize they were in a system where they were all competing. They all had to be the best of the best. And the dad was hard nose. And he was bullish and he was stubborn and the wife just went along with it. I mean, the thing was Fritz was an asshole pretty clear. And it was funny where Missy Hyatt was on Twitter or X talking about how she was hoping not to go ahead and have to see Fritz in such a bad light because she had a good relationship with him, you know, in terms of business. Yeah. But you know what? At the end of the day, he was still an asshole. Now, might not be far off from other families. Now, listen, from everything else that goes along, do I feel like that part of the reason that several of the brothers decided to take their own lives initially came off as a result of how Fritz treated them, 
I mean, maybe a little bit that pressure got to them, obviously. But it all starts at the beginning with David and David's passing. And let me tell you, when they decided to go the route of like basically the last hour of the movie and they go through one by one, each brother passing away. They didn't go to Jackie. Then I mentioned Chris. They went through, it was, you know, I mean, what they did was they went through and decided to go ahead and give us who they wanted to go and give, right? They wanted to go with David, Kevin, Carrie, and Mike. That was the focus. The casting of them, I like. They, from what I remember seeing of those four Von Eric brothers, they were well depicted. I think that who they brought in our actors were really strong and very good at what they were doing. If I had to pick, you know, who did best out of the whole lineup, I mean, David wasn't there the whole time. But let me tell you, Zach Efron playing Kevin Von Eric, you know, that movie. You got a man, Sean Durkin directed a movie. You got me several times to cry because that just cut to the heart, man. I mean, I already knew so much about the family and, and just remember, and again, watching what's been out there about the story of world-class championship wrestling and the Von Erics. And like I said, if you want to talk about a movie or, or, or a documentary that really depicted the whole thing, and I will say this again, if you need a movie that absolutely depicts how things were at that time. The best example there was that I've seen is the Von Erich's tragedy and the heroes of world-class championship wrestling documentary. Like I'm telling you that right there was incredible. And just know that I watched that. I've watched that documentary I can't tell you how many times, a lot, but Heroes of World Class, the story of the Von Erichs and the rise and fall of World Championship Wrestling, World Class Championship Wrestling. If you need to go look for it, by all means, go look for it on YouTube. It's there because that documentary, even though it was a little bit crude in their editing and the way that was presented, it was not polished for no any way, but the interviews they got, the people they brought on, like everything. They had Mark Lawrence on it. A lot of time with Gary Hart, who was not depicted in that movie, which I wish he was a part of because he was a part of that as well. You know, a lot of David Manning, a lot of, you know, the Mantells, Johnny, and I forget his brother's name that was in it, Skandar Akbar, all of that. And the way that whole story came about Chris Adams. And Kevin was so much into it. I mean, it was, wow, what an amazing story they give. Bill Mercer, you know, Mickey Grant, all that story. Of course, that's a great part of the story. But they go into the whole story of how the whole world-class championship organization comes to light, becomes a national and international sensation. It could have very well been the company that would have gone at such levels that Vince couldn't have reached yet. They could have beaten Vince to the punch at national and international syndication. They could have been the worldwide company across the board. The director for that documentary is Brian Harrison. An amazing documentary. A great precursor. If you have not watched leading up to the Iron Claw, you want to watch that to have an understanding of what the Iron Claw really gives. Because the way the Iron Claw comes across, you want to have that timeline that the documentary gives and then go into what happens with... You know, I mean, three of of Kevin's brothers, you know, before 35 years old, all dying. And that's not counting Jackie Jr. There were just certain things in this movie that just really, man, it just, it hit me so hard. When I see almost like it's like a heavenly kind of place and I see Jackie Jr. and I see Carrie and David and Mike all in good headspace and they're not messed up and you see them all together together and seeing them all hugged together damn it that just got me and what got me too was Kevin Zach Efron's character 
and, and what he had to go through. I mean, obviously, we know Kevin went through a lot. It's amazing the story that he was able to get that family together. He was the one that got married, raised, he had children, children now he has 13 grandchildren. Like, he, amazing family, moved to Hawaii, got away from everything. And his son still got into wrestling. You know? And he, he said it in the documentary. Kevin said it. You know? I, you know, at first I had four brothers. And then I stopped being a brother. And I'm like, Zach Efron landed that line so well. I mean, he, he nailed it, man. It got me good. I was just, I mean, it was such, it was so emotional. That roller coaster just, it's like just downhill and downhill. And again, curse, a curse, a curse. And I'm like, if David would have just known that when he was feeling sick at the wedding and they made, and they never knew that part about the wedding and that he got, he was throwing up at the wedding and he was all sick and nothing was said about it. And that was right after that, David was going to Japan and David and the future of that, com of that, of the company and the family itself and the legacy that could have been because they showed how Kevin, although a great athlete, was not the best talker. You know, and among the rest of the family, David was. And it wasn't like David was any more, you know, better on with his word language, with his, his, his vocabulary, just what he would say. He wasn't like a Ric Flair or Harley Race or anything like that. But just, he was just real. And he was charismatic and he was just a lot of passion behind him. When you felt his anger, you felt it. Like you felt you wanted to get behind him. And damn it, Ric Flair, go up against David Von Eric at Texas Stadium. The whole setup to that. And I'll tell you, Fritz did a good job of getting that set up and be able to go ahead and push and push and push to get that opportunity. And they did it. And then we get to the part where David doesn't come back. And that family is just shook up. They can't cry. They got They can't wear sunglasses. They, they just funeral after funeral. And because of David first going and passing, and then the brothers succumb to the pressure of having to go and live up to David and live up to the family name. You know, for Fritz to be so selfish and expect his sons to surpass his, what he did was a very a very commendable career because of the fact that he wasn't the world champion. And he had this honest, he had this vendetta against the NWA and going after them. And when David passed, Kerry stepped up, or there was a coin toss between Kerry and Kevin. And Kerry went up. And Kerry could only do so much. Could, because he wasn't necessarily ready to be in that spotlight. I mean, he was there as a star with his brothers, but never as a single star at that level. And because he was world champion, because of the accolades that he had being the world champion, you know, once world class went away and was starting to go by the wayside and Kerry decides to go to WWF. Yeah. They gave him the IC title. I mean, at least they gave him something like, you know, Kerry Von Eric was never the same guy. He was in world class after the accident. He goes in there and no, I'm sorry. It was right before the accident. Right. And he gets released right before Christmas. And I'm like, Carrie, they gave him a good run. Like WWF. I don't think they really did anything where they, you know, they didn't disparage. They didn't tarnish their reputation. I think they did what they could with Carrie because he wasn't one of their guys. And so once again, Vince will not work with one of their, with somebody else's, star and put them over the his own stars he's not going to put them over you know ultimate warrior or hulk hogan or bret hart or any of those kind of types they wasn't going to do that and that's what it comes down to like it's just another good baby face but like you got a lot of the baby faces in the in the roster that surpass and that's the problem is that there was not much you could do about that so carrie's succumbing to the pressure because he can't live up to the legacy of his brother 
And Kevin couldn't do it either because, you know, I mean, again, to, to expect that to happen, you can't. But Kevin, besides the career he had with his brothers and besides the wrestling career he had, the one thing at least uh, you can always, you know, sur- supersede whatever he did for his wrestling in his career because the, the Von Erichs left, uh, left a lasting legacy that will continue to be for years. And I'm glad this movie came out because it gives people the chance to know this story and to look back at this story. And it, I mean, just by the fact that this group of brothers and the whole camaraderie that they had and the fusion and the chemistry they had together in the ring was so great. Either as tag champs, six man tag champs or one of them becoming the world champion. I mean, people would just came just for the family. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, they overshadowed everybody else that was there. Like, they focused on the Freebirds. They focused a bit on Devastation Incorporated. They focused on, you know, Ric Flair coming into the, into, the, into the fold, into the territory, or Harley Race coming into the territory. And the importance of what those, all those stars did. And just knowing that when you have the respect of, you know, the biggest stars there could have been coming into the space, that, you know, the territory system was something to be said about, okay, this territory, which was part of the NWA, right? And then they split off. And as a standalone, AWA is the same way. But world class overshadowed everybody. And then everybody wanted to go work. And remember, there were other territories in Texas that were also prominent. But the one in Dallas was the one that was it. More than, you know... Houston, more than Paul Bosch, more than, you know, I forget the other ones that Jim Ross worked with, but the production of the shows compared to what other wrestling shows were, you can see the difference. You can see the difference when it came to, you know, for Gordon Soley and all his greatness as the Dean of professional wrestling, you got Bill Mercer, who is a, he's a classic, great voice, great delivery by himself and he was fantastic he just got it i mean it, it was just that organization was just so different mark Lawrence, you know unconventional announcing but effective and just it fit that organization i don't know why everything just fit like it did and they made you care and they really they knew how to develop heels they knew how to just so much of what they did so many stars that came out of there. I mean, hell, they only spent a little bit of time on Gino Hernandez and Chris Adams. A lot of more time we could have talked about that. They put on Bruiser Brody. They could have talked more about that. I mean, there was so much more. So much more about the locker room that was surrounding them in that time. Kamala and Killer, and Killer Khan and, you know, the missing Link. And, oh, my goodness, so much. So many different characters. Sure, they might have been somewhat cartoony. You know, Iceman King Parsons, you know, and Gorgeous Jimmy Garvin. Like all these people that we had, like just what an incredible time, incredible time all together. Just so much talent. I remember how much talent came through there. And also didn't even get the chance to focus on the fact of how many stars because of the abuse of prescription pills and painkillers and who knows what kind of injuries and damage they were doing to their bodies. You know, if CTE was an issue of concussions or whatever kind of, you know, there was no treatment out there. There was no wellness policy. There was nothing out there to help protect the wrestlers and their safety. They were just going out there and busting their ass for real. And Texas wrestling was just much tougher. You could see it. And when I look at what they did with that movie, they did such a damn good job. I was so impressed with the casting, with the story that was told, the tone of it. I mean, they just such a, did, did such a damn good job of that movie. And, you know, the, from what I saw of the reviews, they were good. Oh, by the way, Lily James as Pamela. Excellent. She was great. The scores were favorable. I look at Rotten Tomatoes for that. 88% by the critics, 93% by the fans. 
And in the first couple of words of the Rotten Tomatoes review, they say consensus was powerfully acted and profoundly sad. And it was. I mean, what a bummer. And it's something to be said about how they had those stars come in and depicted them. I mean, and I never even knew in the whole story about Mike, but Mike was like, should have never been in the business. And Gary Hart, when he explained it, he was like such a good kid, but it shouldn't have been him in the business, you know? And, and Gary had limitations, and Kevin was great, but it just, you know, it wasn't David. David was the, was the star and kind of overshadowed his older brother right away. And, you know, for Fritz as a booker, yeah, it makes sense for David to go ahead and be put front and center. But, I mean, you're pinning your, your, your sons against each other. Like, how healthy of a relationship is that? And plus, you weren't paying the you weren't paying them at all. You had them struggle because of the fact that you could. <clears throat> I mean, that that shit also was not right either. I mean, he might have shown love for his wife. You could see that, but still, you know, the discipline, how they were raised, I can't knock that part. But I think the way he pinned his and sons against each other in a rivalry like that, and the pressure he put on them to supersede him, that's where he was wrong. He was absolutely wrong. But man, the way they put that movie together and the stars they put into it, they did a good job. So let's take a couple of stories already get in here so far. Now, before Sean Durkin had this movie... He had two other movies called Martha, Martha, Macy, May, Marlene, and The Nest. I don't know any of those. So now he takes The Iron Claw and his brand of realism, they say, according to The New Yorker and their review of this, was that the Von Erich family of professional wrestlers and Durkin's brand of realism is even more rigorous and yet unapologetic. He still has plenty to say, but this time his characters do more than fit his ideas. They inspire his imagination largely because they themselves are creators of fantasy. And damn, I like just, so they show Fritz Von Eric, by the way, Holt McCallany, well, damn good job. Like you, you hate the prick after that. Now you realize how much of an asshole, how much of a, of a, you know, a scumbag was Fritz Von Eric as a businessman, short-sighted, stubborn, and manipulative and narcissistic as fuck. The protagonist is Kevin, the growing up. And then Jack Jr. died at an accident at age of six. Uh, and that's where the whole thought of the family curse, and that's where Kevin brings that across in the movie. And then they make the point that the Iron Claw is as exuberant as it is mournful, and the high spirits of performance and achievement are inseparable from the, plate, from the price that they exact. Kevin's discipline, focused and grounded, Vigorous, enthusiastic performer. And, but for Fritz, it isn't enough that Kevin is locally successful. He was wrongly denied of the Sports Heavyweight Championship, and that's where the whole thing comes in and lies. They make a point that Chris Von Eric was also one of the other sons, but was not brought into the mix. He makes the matter apparent by way of a bit of dialogue that's dropped into the movie Sweetly and Appley in the sequence in which Kevin connects with Pam. Lily James, by the way, she was great. I love her. I, I mean, for her to come in as an autograph seeker with an ulterior motive because she really wanted to go out with him, with Kevin, I mean, who doesn't want a woman like that? Like, I fell in love with her. Just the way the, the way she came across, you're like, wow, like, damn. Really, really good. But that's Lily James. She plays that part good. Baby Driver was another movie I remember her in, and that's just really what she does. That's the, here's her thing. Now, she does more, but that's one of the things I see. The scene of their meeting is one of the most charmingly written and performed romantic encounters of the year in movies. And, you know, they're eating over ribs. And then they talk about, you know, is wrestling fake, prearranged, all that part. And then Kevin explains the championship was a promotion based on the ability and how the crowd responds to you. 
and the professional drama that he faces regarding the response he gets is paralleled by another part of wrestling that is no way feigned or simulated the pain, the physical toll that it takes. Kevin is something of the Moses of the family's path to fame. He shows the way, but lacks the eloquence and his professional fate is sealed when he proves tongue tied in front of a mic at a crucial moment. Right. But he's grounded. Like he was the leader for that locker room for those guys. And I mean, they show so much here. The, the Christian faith, their religious you know, background, didn't know much about that. I mean, kind of figured that would be in the case. But they didn't go wholeheartedly with the wrestling. You got you got a good good chunk of it. Don't, don't get me wrong. But when they got into the tragedies, they really stuck on that. And just that, that was the focus there. And that's the part where you're like, you want to just hit it home. These people were cursed. This, this, this family were so torn apart and couldn't get themselves back together. And ultimately, you know, Fritz and Dottie and Doris, excuse me, they both, they lose all those sons. And the only one that's left is Kevin out of all that. Actors invest their roles with combustible physicality and impacted agony with a sense of natural ebullience and dark shadow depression. Now, Carrie, Jeremy Allen White, who was lip on Shameless, who's also in the Bear, and he's very prominently the the feature star on that show right now. He's very good. He just it, what a it's always odd, always just out there, but strong actor, very good actor. And you look at him, and he's like, didn't know about the Olympic story. I never knew about the whole thing with Mo- that he was supposed to be going to Moscow in track and field. I did not know that. Did not. And then I look at Mike, he resisted the, the resistance of the change, didn't know how much of an issue he was like, really wanted to be the musician more than a wrestler because he just had different aspirations. It's a shame about that. And then David was just, that guy was just, the, he was the, the draw. He was just a different level. You know, of the brothers, he was the standout because he was just the most appealing, the most charismatic the moment though you just attached to the the earliest the quickest it was just amazing well that way they put that together but you know when i look at what kevin's done in his career and marshall and ross and how well they've come along you know, and it's like, I see them together in Hawaii and just then just like, the you know, again, that family togetherness, like it's Kevin has taken the best of what his original family was, but it's not what that sibling rivalry anymore is not like anything like that, you know, and sure raw, you know, her, you know, uh, Ross and Marshall have not reached the levels of stardom they could have had i mean they had their runs in tna for a little bit they had obviously they run in um mlw and other organizations but never you know a, a little bit in AEW, but really nothing to the level of where they should be like honestly i think the von erics the brothers should be in a it should be in a a maybe not the wwe probably not them like an AEW where tony khan i mean there's some too many tag teams in there so the Von Erichs will be lost in the shuffle. I mean, I mean, I guess there's also a matter where Billy Corgan can't afford to go and bring those guys on board and do something with them. But like, it would be, it would be something special to see if the Von Erichs would work in the NWA. MLW, they had a good run in there. I mean, I enjoyed what they did in MLW. They were tag team champions for a long time and they did a really good job with them. And, you know, the wedding with Kevin and Pam and that whole family together, when things were just, it was, that wedding, everything was okay. Everyone was happy. Everyone was together. And like, you know, it was just, it was kismet. I don't know, man. Just, that movie moved me a lot. Heart-wrenching. Tragic. But so well depicted. I mean, the acting... The screenplay, what they did with the movie was 
really good job. It, it's just a tough movie to rewatch. I will say that wholeheartedly. It's a tough movie to rewatch. Now, in some of the ways you see how this family and how they're together and the close knitness that we had, I look at the Von Erics and I transition, transition it into today's wrestling. And you want to know why the bloodline, which, you know, has been going for several years, but was so strong. I mean, seriously, so strong. All the way up until what, June? Like we're just getting so well into the fact that the bloodline was just so good, right? Well into June, up the money of the bank. They were just kicking ass, man. What a wonderful setup of of, of storylines that they had interwoven into the bloodline storyline, but everything was still a part of what the bloodline was doing. It's that closest, that close knitted, you know. I mean the blood, the kinship, which is what let me just say it like this, of so the factions we have right now, you know, the judgment day doesn't have that. It's missing. You can say that about, you know, LWO. You can say that about the new fraction that Karrion Cross is setting up with now with Scarlet with Authors of Pain. You can say that about whatever. But that's one of the things we don't have right there. I mean, if things happen to some of the other stars, like well, that's the thing. We cared about what happened to the Usos and Solo and Roman and the way they were set up. And a manipulation that comes about by Paul Heyman on top of that, right? And then letting in other people and getting them in really close. Like the fact that Sami Zayn got in so close to that group. Honorary Us. And what they didn't make you care about what happened. Which made things even more sweeter when Kevin and Sammy took a tag team titles off the Usos, right? Not a champions. A stellar night of what they did. I mean, what a what a Liberty weekend we had, or Memorial Day weekend. The night of champions and then double or nothing after that. Like it, it was ridiculous. And the bloodline storyline, they've, they've gotten to a point where they already have it where it is, right? The latest thing is now that Solo is expected to be the next tribal chief once Roman steps down. But nothing more with the Usos. The Usos are off to their own device, right? You know, Jay is still over there on Raw and nothing to do with SmackDown. As far as I know, the bloodline is just kind of a like an afterthought. I mean, Roman Reigns is not regularly defending the title. He's going to defend it again coming up, but still when you look at it there's not much more but like that is one of those things where we have that but right now what do we have next like when you think about it what do we have next that we're going to care about coming up on any side of the equation right i mean when you give us emotionally vested interest in stars that's one of the things that is different okay it's different for everyone because you think about the fact that I'm looking at how we're looking with what this, what wrestling's doing right now to give us that same emotional component. Because that was the thing we had. We were emotionally invested. Who is there right now in any of the things we're watching on Raw or SmackDown? Not, not this week, because it was all the best of. But seriously, going into... WrestleMania season. Who is it that we're actually caring about that we're going to be really into? That's the question you got to ask. I mean, it's one thing to have Logan Paul and, you know, takes on whoever he's going to take on for the, after the United States Championship Tournament, right? Roman Reigns is still waiting for his opponent. And it could either be, what, AJ Styles, LA Knight, or Randy Orton, right? And then you have the Royal Rumble, women's, women's Royal Rumble, men's Royal Rumble matches, and then finding out who they're going to be champions out of that. We talked about where we could see those championships, and the stars are going to have that are going to make their rise. Remember, 
of the stars that we've cared about. You know, for a couple of years, seeing Bianca Belair's rise to the top, losing and coming back again and winning. Like, remember, Bianca Belair, we had an emotionally invested interest in her because we really wanted her to win. We wanted her to succeed and move forward. But what do we have now? What do we have right now? Think about that. What is it that we have that is going on with resting in the moment that is really getting us so emotionally invested in what's going on? Because I'm trying to find that out. We can't really put much into what's going on right now in the current WWE landscape because of what we have with no... They're, they're kind of building up a couple of things for Royal Rumble, but not really. But think about it. All right. I mean, AJ Styles coming back and people caring about him coming in. And now he's obviously kind of showing more of a heel tendency. And, you know, this instant, like, friction when it comes to him between him and LA Knight and him and Randy Orton. Okay. With Randy Orton, I think you could feel there's an emotional vested interest because of the fact that, you know, the camaraderie he had with Riddle people really got back behind Randy Orton again and so happy to see him back after 18 months. I think that loss of him, the heart grows fonder. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. We're mostly invested in Randy Orton again. And to see him go up against, to see him go up against Roman Reigns down the line. Yeah. Makes sense. We'll care about that match. And it's also a feasible, credible opponent for Roman Reigns. With AJ Styles, I don't know. But think of the storylines that we had that made us really emotionally invested. Besides the bloodline. When Seth Rollins and Finn Bauer took on each other in a feud involving the World Heavyweight title, they had that great storyline about Finn Balor, you know, getting injured when he won the first universal championship match, right? To become the first universal champion and had to relinquish the belt. And Seth Rollins took it after that. And you think about the hardship that Finn Balor had to never get back to that level again. And his intent was to go ahead and take that belt off of Seth Rollins because that storyline was made a point. And they, and the way they did it, you kind of felt like when there was what Seth Rollins had that, interview segment and then they had the sit down and it's like a soap opera you can see Finn Bauer and a look on his face lasers at like lasers cutting into the heart into the eyes of Seth Rollins piercing him and just threat after threat look what you did you know I'm going to take that back from you I'm going to take what's, what, what was rightfully should be me what I should I'm going to take my place where I should have been because we felt bad when Finn got hurt and couldn't defend. And he never got that to be that level again. So there's a way we had an emotional interest, not the way we should have had it, but somehow they did. The way with Sami Zayn and how his whole deal is the honorary use and the whole setup for that and trying to get him, you know, getting behind him. Some of that's kind of gone now because him and Kevin have gone on their own other ways. And, you know, with some of the stars they've had to work with ever since. The LA Knight thing, I don't understand. LA Knight's one-dimensional. The emotional investment, if there is any, is nostalgia. Because LA Knight is talking like Stone Cold of the Rock. That's it. And some fans are just fiending for someone to be like that again. So he fits a role. He just satisfies an urge for some of these fans to go ahead and live out nostalgia again. So LA Knight, by default, is nostalgic. He's not anything, he's not adding anything new or anything special, but that's all he is. Which is why he has a ceiling on him. And it'll always be a ceiling. For anyone that thinks he's going to get another shot at Roman Reigns, no. What he's trying to do is basically it's a tribute to Stone Cold or the, or, or the Rock. Okay? 
the megastar and everybody's saying, so he's getting everybody to say LA night. It's like, okay, well, he's well, the rock is cooking. And then the, uh, uh, na na, that's again, a stone cold reference. Like it's just nostalgia. And then the biggest thing they've, they've fumbled on so far. I mean, the thing is, sure, you might feel some emotional investment towards them. Some of the fans will because of nostalgia. But it's not sincere. And see, the part is that I think what they could have tipped us off on more of, because we haven't gotten a lot of CM Punk anyway. But the message he gave once he stopped his promo, the first Raw after he comes back, the Raw after Survivor Series. And he talks about, you know, I'm here for the money. I'm here for the check. Like, we want to play off more of the, the real derelict side of CM Punk, the real intent that he's not going to go ahead and uncover right now. Like, it's basically wolf in sheep's clothing. Somebody needs to go ahead and bring the wolf out of him. He needs to be the big bad wolf coming out of this and be exposed. Who's going to do that? Well, that's why I said it should be Roman Reigns that he takes on first as the face. And Seth Rollins is the one that is, you know, already kind of putting that, planting that seed already, eventually. Where Seth Rollins and CM Punk are going to take on each other, but the storyline should be to shit on CM Punk and say, hey, listen, we know what you're here for. We know what you're going to try to do, and I'm going to stop you from doing it. We don't want you here. You know, you already abandoned us. You know, look what you did. Look at how you left us. And just bury him. And then CM Punk shows his bitterness, shows his anger, his vitriol, his detesting of the audience for, you know, chanting him all this time, but it's like they were never really behind him. Like, I want CM Punk to turn heel badly. And then put him in here. Like, that's the problem they're going to have right now is AEW was able to get CM Punk to turn heel, right? He basically did more or less turn against MJF. He did turn heel. Maybe not necessarily the way it was, but like, it just kind of was. But with the WWE universe, the WWE universe is going to be hesitant. They're not going to want to turn him heel. Like, what are you going to do to turn him heel? Because he has to turn heel. To take on Seth Rollins and have a program for the World Heavyweight title, if that's the plan that's going to be done, right, after Royal Rumble, I mean, if he's not going to go ahead and be, if he's going to be left on Raw, whatever, that's the plan. And he never gets a challenge to go up against Roman Reigns. Like, I mean, honestly, once we get to Royal Rumble, I, I don't, like, when the decision comes in that, CM Punk is going to go and decide to go ahead and take his championship opportunity and go up against Seth Rollins. I want Roman Reigns to come in and say, no, no, no. Why don't you take on the tribal chief and egg and, and, and bait him in. Like, I want that. I still think we can get to that point because Seth Rollins shouldn't have him first. You should have him second. Cause then we can expose CM Punk for who he is. And honestly, then you really take away the tarn and then you can just, you can open up and let CM Punk just vent and put aside all the things he had, the animosity he had to this company and the fact that he decided to go and leave. Listen, I'm not having an issue about why he left. Remember, I never had a problem with that. My issue was about the fact of how he decided to go ahead and when he decided to go ahead and leave, we know there's a treatment issue. Okay. But now he comes back in here. There's no explanation for this. We want that as fans. Okay. These diehard fans in the bubble, you should ask for that of CM Punk. Why on earth would you come back after 10 years instead of being just clapping seals and just, Ooh, we're just happy to have him back and fuck F A W. No, expect more out of his return. You want to get me invested emotionally on the CM Punk return? 
then get me to give a shit about why he would even come back in the first place. Sure, cash grab, but let's get more into it. Let's get more into the fact of, you know, make me hate this guy. Make me, you know, appreciate and understand why he comes back. Okay. We don't need to worry about the AW run. Sure. Okay. We're going to negate it. I'll play along with that. But give me some, another reason to go and play along with that. Cause some people are just not happy with the CM Punk run right now so far because, well, we haven't wrestled yet. I mean, he did wrestle against Dom at Madison Square Garden. And apparently the first time he wrestled at Madison Square Garden. And CM Punk lauded. He's all happy. Like, I don't want this to be where CM Punk gets fatigued and the crowd gets tired of him and then they turn him heel. No, what we need to have happen is CM Punk has to start getting the heel turn started up. Okay, this nostalgic run right now, little baby face running up me up here, great. But there is, I mean, if I have to think about who they could have that should be concerned for CM Punk, is like, listen, Seth Rollins, you have more than enough reason to go and have him and CM Punk at odds with each other after a Roman Reigns title defense. And CM Punk loses. He loses his championship opportunity. The Royal Rumble win that he gets goes for nothing. And then he goes after Seth Rollins. And honestly, after that, go after Cody Rhodes. Because then I see Cody, you know, I don't know if Cody's going to get a chance to go after the, after Roman Reigns again, like he should. But they have him on a different brand and they're going to have that brand split the way it is set. Well, they way they want it. All right. But I could totally see where Cody and the move of him coming in to work with CM Punk and, you know, Cody saying how he got away and he made his exodus because he was getting away from people like him. There's something that could be said there where you could use something with Cody on that. I mean, if you want to give us something to work with, obviously CM Punk's not going to be working with younger stars. Like, I don't see him... I mean, work with Dom, but like I don't know if we're going to continue with that going forward. They're going to go and follow along with that. I don't see CM Punk going up against Judgment Day. I don't see that. But if you're going to give me something to go for the next year to make me feel the investment of CM Punk, let's expose him for what for what his real intents for being here, storyline or not. But let's get an explanation. Let's get an understanding of the last 10 years. Why would you come back and let hell freeze over? Why, why would you go and melt hell to come back? What are you doing? Why would you come back here? And don't make it like you care about the fans. Cause if you did, you wouldn't have been gone for so long. Hey, you did a great job of, of making yourself a, such a great name in, the, in WWE in the first place, which is why they kept chanting your name. It was also a great crutch to go ahead and go after the management when they wanted to get after him. After Vince, or after Stephanie, after Triple H, whatever. Especially the Chicago crowd. No matter what, emotional investment. The bloodline gave us that, which is why we enjoyed it so much. Bailey with damage control and the fact that Bailey is going to probably be t- tossed out of that group together. We don't know what that's going to be all about yet. Like, I mean, am I going to care if Bailey gets dumped from the group that she brought together? No, no. I think what they did with edge and judgment day last year, they did a really great job with that because they brought the family into it and edge had a real component to it. Listen, JD McDonough, do you think we're emotionally invested in the fact that he's now become a member, a full-time member of Judgment Day? No. No. And who else? These are the stars we're coming What with Grayson Waller and Austin Theory. What are we doing to care about them? These are the stars we have right now. We're dealing with, okay, what about Bronson Reed? What about, you know, like, give me some reason to care. Make me feel an emotion, anger, outrage, sadness, happiness. Give me something. Make me emotionally vested. This is what is the part we're missing here. The Von Erics did it. 
World class had it. What are we missing here? That's the part I don't understand. I don't know if we were going to understand it. But anyways. Remember, we got weeks to go and get ahead to that. We'll see what they're going to do. What they decided to do with the first Raw of the New Year, all the plans of that. Okay. We know that, what is it, next week that AJ, Randy Orton, and Elliot Knight are all going to face each other. Winner goes and gets a match against Roman Reigns at the Royal Rumble. I think it is this, right? Is that what the plan is? Right. Okay. Whatever. So we go on with that. Now let's go and get into AW World's End and where we are with that now. Because it looks like the most of the card has already been pretty much set up. We're now at a point where we have an idea what the card is and it's finalized. It's going to be a 20-man battle royal for a future AEW TNT Championship match. Hook will defend the FTW Championship match against, or the FTW Championship against Willer Yuta. And a championship final for the AEW Continental Classic for the inaugural Triple Crown Championship, which is the Ring of Honor World Championship, the New Japan Strong Openweight Championship, and the inaugural AEW Continental Championship. And John Moxley beat Swerve Strickland and Jay White to win his respective match, and A. Kingston over Brian Danielson in his respective match. Now they're going to face each other. After all is said and done, Continental Classic, very good, solid matches, right? Necessarily didn't do anything necessarily with storylines, but we just had good matches and good, you know, competition to get to this point again. Julia Hart and Sky Blue, I'm all about them. I I think the transportation of Sky Blue is, wow, she looks amazing now. The new gear, the setup, like what we saw her on Collision and then going on to Dynamite tonight. Yeah, she looks amazing. And her and Julia Hart together, yeah, I uh, can't keep my, my eyes off the TV when I'm watching. Riho and Thomas Tony Storm, that's set up for that. And they've done a decent job of getting Riho back into the mix and Tony Storm here. And also using Mariah May into the mix, which I'm not caring, caring, caring too much. But Thomas Tony Storm, I'm totally, still, still totally into the gimmick. It works. Eight-man tag match. Just announced, which was Ricky Starks, Big Bill, and Don Callis' family with Kyle Fletcher and Powerhouse Hobbs taking on the team of Chris Jericho, Sammy Guevara, Sting, and Darby Allen. This was all set up because you know, originally we were going to have the tag team titles on the line and the Golden Jets were going to take on Ricky Starks and Big Bill, but this is the change. So this is the card took the change. They decided to go this route. Okay. Christian Cage, Adam Copeland, no DQ match for the AW TNT title. God, that's a good match. That looks really good. And a great storyline, obviously, with Christian Cage, Adam Copeland. We're emotionally invested in it. And Christian Cage doing some of the best promo work he's ever done in his lifetime. He is such what a what a heel. What a piece of shit. Excellent heel work right now. Dare I say he's doing a good job of being the top heel of the company in place of MJF. I'm not kidding when I say that. I think he's doing that well a job. And then Swore Strickland coming off the loss in the Continental Classic. He takes on Keith Lee. They're going to reheat that matchup. Okay. And Miro gets Andrade El Idolo because of CJ Perry accompanying Andrade to the ring. And the obvious marriage issues with Miro and CJ. So they got that going on. And then the setup with MJF and Samoa Joe. And the setup where Samoa Joe screwed over. Screwed over MJF. We don't know what the devils are all about yet, but it's an interesting twist. I hope we get a payoff on the devils, on who the devil is, and then Samoa Joe, and what this all means. Because they're trying to think, okay, if Samoa Joe is working with the devil and the devil's men, who is the devil? Who could it possibly be? I'm trying to think. I can't wrap my mind about who would be the person that would be working with Samoa Joe on that. I don't know yet, but I'm curious about it. So we got a very good card coming up this weekend. I will do a post show right here, kingofpodcasts.com for all that. So come back for that. We're going to do that for you. And that's the show for tonight. If you have not taken the time, the Iron Claw is still in theaters. Please go grab a ticket and go watch it. Help keep that movie going along for a second night, uh, for a second uh, showing. 
excellent. Really was just well done. Well, well done. I would absolutely go and recommend that movie to everyone out there to go and watch it for themselves. I endorse it. Listen, I mean, at some point I'll probably watch it again. But like I said, that movie just really pulled my heartstrings, man. They just did a damn good job of it. I must admit. So anyway, that's the show. Oh, I'll do a preview prediction. So let me just do, let me just predict real quick because I will say Hook will retain over Willow Yuta. I will take. Oh man, Eddie Kingston. Ooh man, and we already know the relationship with those two guys getting the comeback in this again. I'm gonna take Eddie. I'm gonna take Julia Hart over Abaddon. I'm gonna take Tony Storm over Riho. I'm gonna take the the faces in the eight man tag. I will take Adam Copeland to win the TNT title. I will take Adam Copeland to win and become new TNT champion. I think that's going to happen. I'll take Swerve Strickland over Keith Lee. I'll take Andrade over Miro. Oh, man. Is Samoa Joe the guy to take the belt off of MJF after a more than a year reign? No. No, but I will take MJF to retain they already took the ring of honor world tag team titles off of him and with the devil's been we don't even know who they are yet but they decided to go okay they took the belts off of him all right but mjf i think continues to retain the aw world title that's why i think we're going to go with that that's where i'm going to go with that all right that's the show for tonight so we got one more show before we wrap things up for the year and as always, I'm so thankful for all of you to go and catch the shows you always do. And you know, pass along the word. Let other fans come along and join for the ride. Feel free to go ahead and reach out to me and you know whatever comments you want to make on the show. Love to hear from you. Please do. And I'll tell you this. Somebody told me that when I talk about CM Punk 2.0... They said I was crying an AW fanboy. Whatever. Anyway, come back after AW World's End. Come back for another Wrestling Podcast because wrestling needs us. <laughs>